you're listening to Hidden Roll, the podcast where we introduce you to the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. Before we jump into this episode, we'd like to give special thanks to Pop, peopleofplay.com, the one-stop hub for all toy and game inventors. Without them, this podcast would not be possible. You're listening to Hidden Roll, the podcast that introduces you to the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. I'm artist, engineer, and game inventor, David Yakos. And I'm game designer, Branson Faustini, and together we get to talk to the people who make the world of fun. And today we've got a dynamic duo that uh, is making the world of fun, I would say, in bringing the world an entirely new sport. Uh, But let me introduce... Uh, Here on the top, we've got Tim Swindle, who has been an entrepreneur for over 12 years, having launched multiple companies. Uh, His first Kickstarter was in 2013. That was very successful, ended up being uh, acquired, and you can find it in Target, Walmart, all over the world. Um, He has brought numerous products to the market in the toy and game industry and the novelty space. And also Scott Brown, he has over 14 years of experience in the toy and game industry, In 2008, he helped founded an educational game concept, um, Marvel's The Brain Store, which uh, eventually turned into over 40 retail stores across the United States. That's no big deal, right? Uh, (laughs) And uh, he's been the creative director for multiple toy companies, and uh, Scott has helped design and launch over 150 products in the industry. Um, so together, when I said dynamic duo, I, you know, I, I meant it. So, uh, Tim, Scott, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having us. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It's fun getting, uh, getting everyone together here. And, um, I guess when we jump in here, you know, one of the commonalities that we find with people who are making the world of fun is, they never grew out of this childhood imagination. And just to kick this off, um, Scott, why don't we start with you? What what was uh, what was little Scott like? Were you uh, were you always a, a toy and game developer? I was always creative. There was always some little thing. I mean, I even have a file cabinet still of some of the stuff I like drew and created as a kid, like little Garfield drawings when I was three or four. I think I always like had a creative soul. Um, like my dad's very creative. And so I inherited that and was encouraged to be creative um, from like a game perspective. I mean, honestly, the earliest game I, I can remember playing consistently as a family is Trivial Pursuit. Um, and it was like, as a really young kid, I would just sit and observe. Um, and then like, I would start to be able to answer some and gradually grew into like just loving that game. And it is a game that, whenever my family is together for an extended period period of time it's the game we pull out we own like 17 versions of trivial pursuit and it is i mean it is our go-to game for some weird reason i don't know a lot of people don't like it although it was obviously a massive seller but trivia is hard but my family just always loved it it's like jeopardy and trivial pursuit those are two big things that's fun yeah And, and what about you tim so yeah, so my upbringing, you know, it was very close with my my grandma, my my mom's mom, and uh, she spent a lot of time at our house and a lot of time at hers, and uh, she was really into games and specifically um, card games, uh, typically with you know deck of cards, playing Kings in the Corner, Pinochle, things like that. Uh, so that's one of my earliest memories is you know spending time with my grandma and uh, you know playing playing card games um, as I got older. Uh, Some of the other ones that stuck out to me until still to this day, uh, Taboo is, you know, probably my my favorite board game. I love playing that one. I had kind of a pinch me moment a couple of years ago where I was on a road trip through California through a random series of circumstances uh, was able to meet the, uh, the creator, the inventor of Taboo uh, out in Carmel, California. And so that was a really cool experience. Really Um, fanboy over. Fanboy over that. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, yes. And like, it's just, he, 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 you know, sometimes it's like you don't don't meet your idols because they'll disappoint. It was like the opposite. You know, he's now become a winemaker and he like was making, you know, wine when I met him and I got to tour his facility and his daughter was getting married and he was making the wine for the wedding. It was just like, I don't know, such a, a cool guy and uh, definitely someone I aspire to be hopefully when I'm when I'm when I'm older. It's, it's funny that you mentioned like your grandma, like, I don't know how many people like bring up their grandmas as far mm-hmm. as like <laughs> what brings them into the, the game industry. I, I think it's part of that family unit, every, bringing everybody together. That must be, must be vital. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And, and, and now as I've gotten older, starting a family uh, and become, have, have become more mission driven with, with what I want to do in life. It really does. Uh, it's, it's maybe cheesy to say, but like, you know, getting that like family time, pulling people away from screens, how can we all interact? You know, people seem to have forgotten this lost art of, uh, just being present with each other. And it's something that I've made my kind of personal mission, uh, that, that things that I'm going to do and I'm going to bring to life, they have to be fun and they have to be about, you know, providing fun to the world. There's a lot of things that I don't know, right now, especially, you know, not a lot of fun things going on in the world. And so I want to try to tilt that the other way and bring fun things to the world. <laughs> your, uh, your grandma comment triggered a memory for me. That, um, so my maternal grandma, my, my paternal grandparents both passed away before I was born. Um, so I only had my maternal grandparents and they lived nearby and we were always over at their home. But my maternal grandmother, when she was a teenager, she was running to catch a train and she slipped and fell and actually fell under the train right as it was starting to go and it ended up um, severing the back of her foot off. Oh, oh and um, so by the time I knew my grandma, she had had her leg amputated and had a prosthetic leg. And so she was, she was more or less immobile. She was in a uh, kind of mechanical chair. Uh, it was like a lazy boy on steroids. Um, And she would sit in this chair and interact with us. But the way we would bond with my grandma is through gameplay. And it was almost always through a hide and seek. And so, you know, it's kind of a funny thought, like, how does this person that's in mobile play uh, hide and seek? But she would she would close her eyes. We would go hide somewhere in the house. She would stay in her chair and then she would just shout out guesses as to where we were hiding. <laughs> um, and you know, she was right. We had to be honest and we had to kind of come out of our hiding spot. Uh, but it's like one of the most profound memories of my uh, childhood with my grandma was that playing of, of games with her and the way it was a bonding experience. It was a way we were able to uh, bond and for her to be able to kind of interact with her grandkids because she wasn't the grandma that could kind of pick us up and throw us in the air or they could do the normal grandma things. She was, she was immobile, but she was able to bond through game through games. I'm going awesome. to have to remember that game, the shout hide and seek after a, yeah, after a long day of work with the <laughs> kids go <laughs> hide. <laughs> Are you like, in the pantry? What I'm do with my grandkids if you're too. in the pantry, bring me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I like it. Yeah. That's how I play with my kids. Mostly now too, is for my chair. <laughs> So uh, talking about sort of bringing uh, the, the fun with everything you do, um, uh, getting into the industry of play, what's, uh, what's that journey look like for both of you? How did you uh, get started in the industry? Um, yeah, I, I, can, I can start us off. Uh, so at the time... Um, I was a software entrepreneur. I was uh, building a software company uh, living in Chicago. And, um, you know, it was a pretty stressful environment. We we had raised a lot of capital, VC backed, burning a ton of cash, running big teams. Um, And as, as a bit of like a passion project, wanted to scratch my own itch. I, I had this, idea for a board game for a card game and it uh it, it kind of stemmed from i read an article in ink magazine about uh, cards against humanity and they had laid out the kind of 
playbook for what they did to launch uh, because they were just a bunch of kids right out of high school that uh, ended up launching Cards Against Humanity. And it triggered something because there was a game that I had been playing with friends of mine up at lake houses and on the weekends, you know, when we're late at night and don't, you know, run, run out of things to do and, you know, drink, have still a lot of, a lot of beers left to drink. And, uh, <laughs> would come up with this idea that ultimately became utter nonsense, which was the game that I launched. So as a passion project on the, as a passion project on the side, um, I launched this game and, uh, just did, did a little Kickstarter to get it going again, had no background in games or how, how to do anything with, you know, creating a game. Um, but that, but that got it going. Uh, it was, you know, barely funded, you know, just, just hit our goal. Uh, but it was the first win and, uh, you know, it started, started me on this journey in, in the toy and game space was launching that, that first board game of utter nonsense. That, that uh, Kickstarter journey can be a, can be a stressful one, like full of all of the, the trials and, uh, it's like the longest 30 days of somebody's life. <laughs> yeah. I, so I've done a couple and I have not figured out the recipe. You know, when you see these folks like exploding kittens do millions of dollars, uh, hats off to them. Just I don't know what they're doing. Right. <laughs> but I have not figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Scott? How did you, uh, how did you guys, how did you dip your, your toe into this business? Cause you've been, you've been at it for a while. At it for a while. I mean, it's a funny thing when I look back. Um, so when I was in the moment with a lot of these events, it felt really painful and hard. And then, you know, you reflect back and it seems like kind of such happy memories. Um, uh, it started, honestly, I started out of college with a startup in Utah, um, and it was like in a totally different industry. It was in road repair, <laughs> like innovative road repair technology. And, uh, I, you know, I like the startup space. Uh, I like innovation, but man, it was just like a different world for me. And, uh, and like I'd go to these trade shows in Texas and after a week, I'd come back with a Texas accent. And like, it was just like. Uh, <laughs> Are those the most exciting trade shows you've ever been to? These uh, road repair world. <laughs> yeah. I just fell asleep as you were talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was dreary. Um, so not to knock it, because it was a really like, it was a good experience. And I learned a lot along the, way, along the way, but I it was not a fit for me. This is sort of a dreary story, but like I disliked my job so much that um, that on the way to work some days, like tra- traffic would suddenly slow. And I kind of like hope that the car behind me would just bump into me enough that I would like, be be late for work that I'd have to like <laughs> pull off to the side and figure all that out and be like a few hours late for work. Um, but thankfully, you know, through through a lot of luck, I was given an opportunity to move to Chicago and join a business incubator. And the model there was we're going to hire a bunch of creative people, mostly young. You know, we were all in our 20s and a fresh out of college for the most part. Um, and we're going to give you guys office space. We're going to give you guys some kind of mentorship um, and, and give you some capital if you come up with some clever ideas. And so we would always start, we'd have these like weekly brainstorming sessions and people would come to the table with pain points, various pain points from their lives. And we would just sit and think about, all right, well, if that's a pain point, what could we do to address it? And uh, we, we had one where we were talking about aging, the pain point of aging. And someone came with an article from, I think, the New York Times that was like the top 10 fears of baby boomers. And number two on that list was cognitive decline. And we thought, oh, that's like an interesting, uh, interesting fear. Like what, what the impetus for the fear? What are people doing to address it? And, and uh, a couple of people were like, well, let me, we're going to spend a week just like digging into that and just see if there's interesting opportunities around that. And they came back to the table a week later and were like, you know, there's all this cool all these cool products, specifically scientific software coming out. Uh, there's this term neuroplasticity, which was emerging, which is this idea that the brain can continue to kind of grow and reshape itself and learn new things as you age. And so we're like, oh, this is so interesting. We are all interested in it. I bet the world is. Let's try and aggregate all those products together in one space. And we started opening a kiosk at a mall just outside of Chicago in Schaumburg, Illinois. And 
I mean, the honest answer is that kiosk was an epic failure. Um, so the whole <laughs> premise of this incubator was, we want you guys to test ideas quickly and kill them if they're bad. Um, and in fact, they even used, like, they used the metaphor of a goldfish because it's a pet that, like, you don't feel too bad if you have to kill the pet. Are you <laughs> saying the gold, goldfish is the disposable, flushable pet? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and it, I, I'm sorry for people that love goldfish. It wasn't my idea. But we even had a, we had a wall where we would put our ideas, and they were even in the shape of goldfish that we'd put on the wall. So <laughs> the idea was, look, we'll give you a little bit of money just to test kind of the minimum viable product to find out if this is good. And we did, we opened this kiosk and I worked at that kiosk. So did the co-founders, like we all took turns. It was like another miserable experience. We were just sitting there, just begging people to come over. I mean, I think in the three months we ran that kiosk, we probably had a couple dozen people stop. It, it's like you're there next to hair straighteners and hand lotions and you're trying to sell $300 <laughs> scientific software and people were like, get out of my way. So we, we were ready to kill it. We were like, Yikes, this is, did not go well. Sorry, we wasted your money. And thankfully, we had a champion there at Sandbox who was like, listen, I still think there's something here. It like was fortuitous because at the same time, this is fall of 2008, the economy was, was, starting to, was starting to collapse. And we were offered a really amazing retail location in downtown Chicago. And they had seen our kiosk. So even though we thought of it as a failure. They had seen it and thought it was a clever idea. They were like, we need you in this space. Um, like it's a good lesson there. Like you just never know who's going to see what you're doing and it might feel like a failure, but, but often like other opportunities emerge out of those failures. So that was what this was, was this, okay, we're going to give you this retail space just off of that, the magnificent mile. Um, and we opened that store in like a few short weeks. And it was like, night and day difference. Immediately customers were coming in, they got what we were trying to do. They loved what we were trying to do. And it was like the start of, of Marbles the Brain Store and what became kind of a really fun ride. It had its pain points. A lot of people listening to this know some of the pain points. It was a roller coaster ride of joy and pain, um, but it was also really neat and uh, kind of started with one store, opened a few more. We kind of test and learn and test and learn and ultimately had it. 40 retail stores across the U.S. after 10 years of, of running that chain. That's a it's a big big shift going from the the mall kiosk, competing with the hand lotion guy. <laughs> it was it was a very different experience. I will say I will never do a kiosk again. That was not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just like chasing people down as they're walking by. Oh, it was hard. <laughs> a little bit of work. So. Both of you started step, you know, had your toe in the in the industry. I'd say you more than your toe. Your whole body was in at this point. Um, but how did you guys end up then connecting? Yeah. So uh, shortly after I I finished doing the the Kickstarter campaign for that game Utter Nonsense, uh, through a mutual connection, was introduced to Scott. Basically, it was actually the day that the Kickstarter ended, and uh, was put in touch with Scott, and he was pretty much immediately was like, Hey, like I, I saw your game and I would love to carry it in our stores. And, uh, the, the interesting thing about that was, you know, when I first started, it was, the idea was to shun retail. Cause that was the blueprint that cards against humanity had. And I was like, ah, you know, do I do this? Do I not do this? And something about just Scott that resonated with me and, and liked how he presented himself and presented the opportunity with marbles, uh, decided to give it a go. And, uh, so that was, you know, our first retail customer was, uh, was Marvel's the brain store. And, you know, thanks to, to Scott for taking a chance on us. And, uh, so that, so that was how we met. Um, and then I'm forever grateful for Scott because then from there, uh, you know, Marvel's had built up a, a really strong brand within the industry for kind of knowing, uh, what was coming like they had their their pulse on trends and you know would re they developed a reputation for finding kind of the next big thing so to speak and so uh from that uh target ended up giving me a call about a month later um also interested in bringing our game to all 1700 of their stores so 
this all just happened very quickly. Uh, this was not typical for any other business I'd ever been involved with that, uh, you know, things are moving so quickly. Um, but, you know, that was kind of the, the, the journey was, you know, meeting Scott through Marbles and you know, through that relationship, obviously you start out as a business relationship, but I think we just kind of connected on, a, on another level. And we also became close friends from that and had always, uh, as, as our paths kind of went in different directions, um, you know, I ultimately sold uh, Utter Nonsense and and Scott with, you know, Marbles ended up getting acquired as well. Uh, we'd always talked about wanting to do something together. And uh, so we stayed in touch as friends and then, you know, ultimately found the, the, the right opportunity to pursue something on our own together. I, I've got to tell the story when I first met Tim in person. So some of this interaction, like when they decided to carry his game was just over the phone. Um, but I think it was the first time we met, Tim. Do you think it was the first time we met when you came in to film that video? I think that's right. I think okay. that might be. All right. Yep. So this is like when I knew that Tim was going to be like someone I could bond with. And when you hear why, it's weird. But, um, but <laughs> so he had this game under nonsense, which is like a little bit of a, like an adult lean. Um, one of the things about the game was like you'd lift the box and it would reveal this like properly dressed English gentleman, and then you'd lift the box and it would reveal that they weren't wearing any pants. Um, and so it's like a clever packaging element. So Tim's like, you know, Tim's always thinking about marketing angles. And so he's filming these product training videos. So one thing we did well at Marbles was we would really try and put our customers in connection with the games we were selling. So we would do live demonstration of everything we sold. And in an effort to do that well, we would interview the inventors of games and show those videos to our employees. And so we invited Tim and his, his business partner into our offices to film a video. And Tim filmed this whole video and his partner, and like pretty proper, you know, like well-dressed up top and like they finished. And then at the end of the video, they both stand up and reveal that they're just in briefs. Um, and kind of have been doing the whole pitch in just underwear. And I'm like, all right, like, that's what you got to do to stand out. Like, I like this guy. Um, <laughs> he, he gets it. And and we really just like clicked there and just vowed. And like, it's funny, like after seeing Tim in his briefs and like chatting with him, I'm like, we're going to work together someday. Um, <laughs> so that was the moment we decided Very we were going to figure something out. And it, it took a few more years to, to work together. Um, uh, you know, my the next stage of my path was like at Marbles had a it, we'll call it kind of a messy finish. Um, but thankfully, a big toy and game company, Spin Master, came in and and um, helped in that transition from what it was to kind of what it became. And I was able to join Spin Master and and work there for three years and had a great experience there at Spin Master. We can talk more about that. But um, but after that, it was like all right, I'm ready for the next stage. For some weird reason, because marbles was wildly stressful for me. Um, like it was a, a hard, hard journey. As fun as it was, it was a really stressful experience. So I'm like, all right, I'm like, for some weird reason, drawn to that stress of entrepreneurship, and so decided to kind of get back into it and then like go off on my own again. And I like recognize something in myself, which is I don't work well alone. I, like I need a partner, and so it's like, who is the right partner for me? And Tim has just always felt like the right match. For my personality type and we can talk more about why but that's kind of wh where we connected and then kind of has, has led us to where we are now that's uh it's interesting as we work in this industry you know we talk a lot with like the game inventors and then a lot of a lot with um the companies that are then bringing the products to the market and you know there's something when you talk about the stresses of entrepreneurship there's something completely different about like as an inventor, I can take my idea, even though it was like, you know, I blood, sweat and tears went into it. All these, you know, thoughts, sleepless nights. Um, but I'm eventually just handing that over and then I'm hands off going forward. When you're launching a product and it's underneath your your brand, you're all in all the time. You want to touch on that a little bit? Just like some of the like, what are some of the obstacles? What are some of those stresses that? that you're seeing, but it's got to have some equal and equal reward to that as well. Like I'd like to hear your guys' perspective on bringing products to the world. Yeah. So, uh, you know, with, with utter nonsense for me, that was the first one I, I had done. And I almost didn't know that you could 
do another version of that, which is a, like a royalty. Um, so it, that's one of those where, you know, ignorance was bliss, I guess. And I thought the only way to launch a game was that you had to bring it to market. Uh, didn't really understand the whole, you know, ecosystem that uh, is within the toy and game space. And so, so because of that, you know, just kind of learned the hard way, you know, school of hard knocks, a uh, lot of Google searching. I mean, even as simple as like, you know, how do you, how, how do you, you know, mine was only a deck of cards, but I mean, literally have no experience on producing anything physical in my, in my life. Um, and so I just remember Google searching all these terms um, and that was just on the manufacturing side. And then, you know, much less, you know, the really hard part, which is ultimately selling, you know, selling your product into retailers and whatnot. And I'll never forget uh, when we were on the calls with the target buyer early on. And so a little bit of backstory there was, so they approached us about bringing the game into the stores. You know, we'd only been in live for about one month. And, you know, you hear some of the trials and tribulations of working with big retailers and how, you know, if things don't go well, there's all these ways that they can kind of claw back uh, that could bury you, basically. You know, if, if they decide that the product's not selling well, you'll have to buy it back from them and all these really scary things that can happen when working with larger retailers. And 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 so we were aware of that and it made us nervous about working with them. And to the credit of the buyer, which I'll, you know, Mark Toma, who's since become a close friend, listened to all of those concerns and would respond, you know, to each one of those. And what one of mine was like, hey, like, how, how do we sell this thing? You know, we don't have a big marketing budget. And he was like, well, I'll give you an end cap space. And so here he's on this call and it's like everything went kind of, everyone kind of quiet. Cause like that, that's now I know a really big deal when a buyer offers you end caps. And I had no idea what that meant. So I remember just Google searching end cap uh, <laughs> on the, while I was on the call to understand, you know, what it was that he was saying. And there were some other terms that I don't remember, but I just, I do remember the fact that I had to, while I'm on the call with him, you know, he's searching up these terms. Um, so <laughs> It, it, it was it was like I call it, you know, my my MBA, you know, that that time period of, you know, learning how to create a product from scratch, hiring designers to design packaging, design the artwork for the cards, um, you know, like I said, finding the manufacturer, finding distributors, um, working with retailers, all the retailer terms, things like that, uh, launching, you know, marketing campaigns, uh, social media campaigns, things like that. Mm -hmm. So you're right. It is a lot. <laughs> and, you know, I think one of the things I've found is that those are things I like to do. And so there's a lot of people that I've met in this space um, that I think would prefer to just be on the creative side and the purely creative side of just coming up with ideas. And they just want to come up with ideas and then, you know, hand them off to somebody else, like you said, and let them kind of take it from there. Uh, but I know for me personally, like I do enjoy all those other messy things that involve, you know, actually bringing a, a game to the market and publishing it and distributing it. I'll just add one thing, which is, so to your original question, which was, uh, you know, what is different between kind of licensing it off or you know, taking it from idea all the way to market? I, I mean, one of the things is you have no one to blame but yourself if it doesn't go well. Um, and, you know, I've licensed a few games too. And, you know, when it doesn't go well, like my, my reaction always is, well, that company screwed up in, in selling this thing. <laughs> like it's never my fault. Um, when, when you are the one that also takes it to market, yeah, it, it is always, I mean, it's your fault if it doesn't go well. I mean, it's either a bad idea or a bad execution of the idea or a bad execution of the marketing. And so you feel a lot of pressure around it. Like you have no one to blame. And so, um, I guess the, the positive of that is that you feel really, um, it feels very personal. And so you're like, just really much more, um, invested in it. I feel very invested in these games when we're launching them. Cause I'm like, no one to blame, but myself. So I'm going to make sure that I'm not to blame. And we really <laughs> like try and do everything. And I'm like, I'm still sweating a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, Right before this call, I was out scrambling, trying to film video of people playing this new product that we're launching. And like, you know, we, we're, we're trying to act scrappy and um, 
I don't want to hire a videographer right now. So I'm out there with my iPhone, like filming these <laughs> videos and like, like just sweating. And I'm just like an embarrassing mess as I joined this podcast because of that. So it's just <laughs> that you're like, you do these things that just show that you care a lot about this product success. It's a real deal. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, that's a great transition into talking about kind of what Paddle Smash is and then maybe how it got started. It's, uh, it's inception. Um, yeah, I'll take this one. Um, so because, so my role at Marbles was, uh, kind of chief merchant and I was the one that would evaluate really every concept that came through the door. And over 10 years, I don't know, I should have added up, like make a rough estimate, but I mean, it had to have been tens of thousands of concepts that I evaluated um, over those years. And I think through that process, you just invariably develop a bit of an antenna. I mean, granted it's an antenna for what I personally like, but you also get a sense for what tends to do well in the marketplace. Um, and so, you know, for one, I feel like I've developed a decent, a decent antenna for finding good things. And then for two people now know me for a place to come kind of get a knee jerk reaction. So a lot of people come and ask me my opinion on product. I probably have two people or so reach out every week saying, Hey, can I just show you my concept? And I'm always happy to do it. It's good for me. Um, happy to help other people. Uh, and so, you know, honestly, like as with most ideas, like most of the stuff people show me, I don't think they're great. Um, I don't tend to pe tell people their ideas aren't great, but I'm usually cautious. It's like, hey, listen, like take your time, like really find out from everyone else if this is good or bad. And like, I have concerns. Um, so what that means, if just for everybody listening, when Scott says that to you, what he's saying is that's a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I might... Yeah, I probably should be more direct. And sometimes I think it's a terrible idea. Um, but no, usually I'm a little more gentle. Um, so yes, that's what it means if you're listening. <laughs> so, I think the idea is terrible. No, I mean, I'm always happy. So people that are listening, yeah, pl please feel free to reach out to me. And I'm happy to evalu evaluate concepts. Um, but but yeah, I so with that context, I got I got introduced to a guy who was like, hey, my brother-in-law invented a game. And I literally hear that probably 15 times per week. I mean, David, you probably hear that 15 times per week too. Yeah, it's, like, it's like endless. Every time you, every time people find out you're in the industry, they say, well, I know someone or I invented a game. Well, sometimes that awesome. invention is not even an invention yet. It's more of a problem. Like I invented a, a thing to get, I don't like snow on my deck. Like, <laughs> well, that's not a product yet. It's just a problem a still. So yeah. yes, I hear that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, and it's a good lesson. Like the idea stage is, I think, pretty easy. Like ideas are easy. Execution is really hard. Um, so, you know, I think th this guy says, well, my, my brother-in-law created a game. And I'm like, well, cool. Uh, he's like, well, would you be willing to meet with him and just like hear about it? I'm like, always, for sure. Um, so he connected me with him and he gave me a quick pitch over the phone. And he's like, listen, here's my story. And his story is that he's, a dad of seven kids, six of them are boys, almost all of them are teenagers. And he's just like a dad that wants to play with his kids. He's not the dad that plays hide and seek from his chair. He's like, I, <laughs> I want to like get out my backyard and play with these kids. And they love spike ball. Um, and it was just like the dad couldn't keep up with the kids in spike ball anymore. So Joe, uh, Joe's like, all right, well, pickleball, I can keep up with him. Pickleball is this new sport. Um, and we're going to like, we're going to go to the local courts and play pickleball. And they all got into it. But the problem was the nearest court was 20 minutes away. The courts jam packed. I mean, pickleball fastest growing sport in America right now. Um, and it's just wildly popular. And so they'd go to these courts. They'd always have to wait. And Joe's an, a structural engineer. You can relate to this, David. Uh, he's like an engineer. He's like, all right, well, here's my problem. I'm going to figure out a solution. And so he's got a CNC machine, he's got a router, he's got all these toys in his garage, and he's like, I'm going to figure something out. He's like, I'm going to merge these games. So he created a marriage of spike ball and pickleball. And he basically like used his router, glued a bunch of plastic together and created this base 
David, I know for a fact you know about this base because David ultimately helped us with this. And so David's played on this base and saw this thing. Um, but he made this it's a beautiful prototype. Pretty, and it's like, actually a really great prototype. For all the people uh, that make prototypes out there, everybody's like embarrassed about trying to show things like because sometimes they're just made out of cardboard or plywood or whatever it is. But really, that's what it takes just to get your idea out as fast as you possibly can. And and uh, he made a nice, sturdy, playable prototype, a bit heavy. Yeah, but it was and, and to be great. fair, I mean, it was two years of refinement to get to where it was that I saw it and you saw it, David. Um, so he, you know, he's a consummate tweaker of, of the dial. And so he's like, just he, he would create a prototype, he'd test it with a group of family members and like, then he would want to refine it. He'd like want to change the angle or something. And so um, ultimately he landed where he landed and he invited me up to his place. Like I had the phone call. I was like, all right, that's actually pretty interesting. He lives not far from me. So I'm like, I'm going to come and see this thing in person. I went and played it. And like really within, within a few minutes, I'm like, this is real. Like, this is fun. There's something here. Um, and so I, as I said, like, I need a partner in business. I just like, I'm a creative soul and my creative soul loves to chase the next shiny thing. And so I know I need someone that keeps me focused on things. So I called Tim and I'm like, listen, I think I found something. So Tim, I'm going to hand it to you for a second and you can just share your perspective of like receiving that call. <laughs> uh, so yeah, when Scott called me, I would say I was busy with other things and wasn't necessarily you know, looking for uh, my next project. And so the timing wasn't great. And so I was a little bit skeptical. However, just knowing Scott so well and what he said about how many concepts he sees always getting hit up to see different projects. And that's what he'd been doing as the chief merchant, you know, at Marbles and, and, and looking at the concepts for so many years. When something catches his eye, that's really telling. And so I was like, okay, like, this is something that I need to take seriously, um, but I need to get my hands on it as well. And so basically immediately booked a flight out to uh, Utah and uh, went to go meet with Scott and he had the prototype at the time. And I was like, let's, you know, let's play this thing. Let's, let's take it to uh, Scott has some pickleball courts, you know, 15 minutes from his house that we can go set up shop and, you know, try to get some raw feedback of people that, you know, don't know us or aren't friends that, that can just give it a try. And um, so so that was, you know, when I became a believer was going out there, you know, we initially played it at his house, just him and I, I had a ton of fun playing it. I actually don't play pickleball. So for me, is this like total outsider from, or spike ball really. And it's kind of this, you know, perfect combination of the two combining the best elements of pickleball and the best elements of spike ball. Um, and so I, I picked it up quickly, had a, had a ton of fun with it. We brought it to these pickleball courts. Uh, we saw it was like flies to honey. People were just like, what is that? And they were coming over, playing it. There was one gentleman I remember. I have video of it because actually him and Scott were playing. And he has this big smile on his face the whole time. And he was just like, this is fun. This is fun. This I just remember him being like, this is so fun. And then he ended up leaving. And we just thought like, goodbye. Comes back five minutes later. He's like, I needed my son to see this thing. So he grabbed his 16-year-old son. They played around with it. And it was just in that moment that we were just like, okay, we've got something, you know, let's, let's take this, you know, let's take this to the next step. So what do you think and the think magic is of like, cause you, you guys are basically bringing a new sport to the world. Um, what is the magic? Cause people love spike ball, people love pickleball, but like, why, why the big smiles? Why did he go get his son? What's, what's the secret sauce? Part of it is, I think that spike ball I love that game. I mean, it was sold in my stores. I, there is zero of me knocking that game right now as I say this. All I'm saying is it's hard to play. And um, and as you get older, it's harder and harder. And so, you know, the our origin story of the game, I think is something felt by a lot of people, which is like dads that want to keep playing with their teenage kids and can't keep up anymore with spike ball. You know, like their teenage kids diving around, hitting this ball, and it's like, there's no chance. We don't dive. When you're in your forties, you don't dive anymore. You don't dive anymore. Yeah. You just stop diving. <laughs> um, so what we really liked, and I think the smile was like dad realizing he has now a sport he can beat his son in. Um, he's like, this is something I can actually compete in. 
I mean, this is real because I went back. I, I know this guy now. His name's Alan. His son's name is Dylan. And just this week, I went and filmed them doing testimonials for, of the product. They've played it a few times since. Um, and I went in their backyard and it was just like dad smiling the whole time because he was beating his son. And he, he ended up winning um, in this round we played. And he's just like, you can just tell what he's feeling is, hey, like there's a game we can play where I can compete. Um, and what it is, is just like we, we're trying to create a game that's family friendly. Um, that, like, you know, and spike ball can be like it's a lovely game, but it's hard, as I've said. And so what all of our design choices have been around making it so play is contained and easier to play. And you know a lot of this, David, because I mean, everyone that's listening knows that hopefully that David is an engineer, runs an engineering firm. Um, and so we enlisted David's help with this product. And so his engineering firm helped us to create a base that bounced properly. The big challenge was this prototype this inventor made was incredible, but it was like, I don't know, how heavy was that thing? 50 pounds? Oh, yeah, <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it took two people to move. <laughs> yeah, like it was super heavy. He had glued multiple level layers of plastic together. And we're like, well, obviously can't have it be that heavy um, for mass market production. Like, And so what, what we had to figure out was how to make a thinner plastic that also had that same ba- balance. And what the balance was, we, we needed a, a plastic that would absorb the balance. Um, we had experimented with playing this on a spike ball net. And it was like you'd hit into that net with a with a pickleball paddle and a pickleball, and the ball would bounce a mile into the air. It was like impossible. <laughs> I, I felt like it was impossible to keep up with. And then you'd hit these hard angle shots and you just have like never have a rally. So we're like, all right, well, what do we need is we need a plastic that absorbs the shot and we need a net system. And this is the inventor that figured a lot of this out, but that net system that's around the base. And if, if you're linking to this, or showing video throughout this interview, David, you people can see a visual of the, what this looks like, but it's like a hexagon plastic base and then a net system that extends up the sides. And that net system is, the reason we have it is to make it so you're required to hit a downward shot. Um, and that downward shot then causes the ball to pop up. It just makes the play stay contained. Um, where like, even last night I was filming a bunch of teenage kids playing this and they all want to do the spike ball thing, which is hit as hard as they can and send it a mile into the air. But it just doesn't do that. They'll hit as hard as they can, and the ball just bounces up into a re- returnable shot, which to me is amazing because then it just leads to this 30 and 40 shot rallies. Um, so, I mean, what was the smile? And like, it's a smile I've seen over and over over the last year of development is like people love games where like, you can play across a broad range of ages. And when play feels like I, I have a chance here, like, especially dads, like I have a chance here. So that's a little <laughs> bit of the well, I think there's, there's another element of that, that that's got to be exciting is being able to bring that to your backyard because, you know, you think of all the, the courts or clubs, you know, people need memberships to a lot of these places and it's not a, not that easy to have a membership for your whole family to go to the gym. And this is something where people can just set it up directly, you know, unfold it, set it up and play wherever, take it with them. That's a, uh, that's gotta be part of yeah, that, that secret was, sauce. Yeah. And again, as, as you know, that, that was one of the big challenges for us was to not just, you know, recreate this base to make it playable as the, the original prototype, um, but then also make it portable. And so that's one of the things we're super proud of uh, with what we achieved with you guys was, you know, this thing folds up very nicely, like a suitcase. You could fit all the components inside, four paddles, two balls, the entire net system, you know, folds up like a suitcase and is, you know, easily portable to, you know, backyard, parks, beaches, et cetera. And um, yeah, that was another thing we just saw from my, from the business side of it as an op- as the opportunity was okay, pickleball, uh, it's the fastest growing sport in America. I think you, you can't really turn on the news these days without seeing some highlight of pickleball being covered. And yet it's still very nascent. It's not uh, readily available in all areas. It doesn't, there's not courts everywhere you go. A lot of times, you know, they're you know, 20 minutes away. If you get there and they're packed, you know, you're sitting there waiting around. And so we just felt like 
you know, there's a big enough opportunity with the pickleball crowd specifically that would like to have that flavor of pickleball in their backyard. You know, like you said, 40, 40 grand or so to build a court. Like that's not really feasible for almost everyone in America. So, you know, here's this, you know, way that you can get a little flavor of pickleball just in your backyard and, uh, you know, make it more accessible um, for people to play it. We, we, so we've been getting some pre-sales. It's not available yet, but we, we're reaching out to everyone that buys right now to find out how they heard about us and why they, why they purchased. And we had a good one this week where we reached out to this woman and she was like, my son and I play pickleball together. This is like an older mom and like a teenage son. And this is how we bond. And the teenage son saw one of our social media posts of us playing or someone, uh, I think it was the inventor's kids playing. And uh, he was like, ran into his mom's room. He's like, mom, like watch this, <laughs> showed her. And then she was like, we have to get this thing. And the reason she said was um, one, that they want to have this pickleball experience that they can kind of take with them wherever they go. But two, the courts are crowded at pickleball. And so they're always waiting. And they're like, this is a perfect thing to set up outside the courts and play while we're waiting to get into the courts. Well, for, for those that are you know, watching on, uh, on YouTube, you, you, know, you, you can see we'll, you know, we're able to share these videos. But for those that are listening on all the other, uh, all the other outlets, we'll, just, we'll share the links to all of these things in the, in the content below. And there, uh, Tim's holding up. I can uh, show it to you. Holding it up, yeah, yep. for those that are on audio. Tim's holding up the suitcase version of this thing. So, yeah, I mean, paddlesmash.com is the website people can go to to see more about the game. We've got some great video on there showing how, how it plays. So yeah, there's up and close. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of the background of the game and how it plays. So that's gotta be exciting when, um, when you put something out there and people start to start to respond. Uh, what are some of the other challenges of trying to get a product like this um, in front of people? Like what's, what are some of the bigger hurdles that you have to jump, some of the mountains that you've got to climb to do that? I think with with this one in in particular, you know, cost is a factor. You know, so I think with with my first game, you know, it was a deck of cards. And so that was something that was easily self-fundable. And uh, as you go up the complexity levels, you know, the cost increases too. And so, you know, that, that, that's something that we had to you know, address and we actually did end up raising a small amount of capital uh, for this concept. And so that's, you know, I'd say just another hurdle, you know, was a capital raising process and, you know, putting that deck together, putting the business plan together, you know, finding the right people that might be interested in, in backing something like this um, just because, you know, as you've seen, with you know creating this this base in the court you know it requires you know pretty expensive tooling from our manufacturer and so and the you're you're not cheap david <laughs> so but worth it uh, so, uh, yeah <laughs> um, and so you know the the design the upfront design and engineering costs um, so anyway you know we did have some pretty strong interest in this just with our network uh, you know, we are, I guess, fortunate that we've had some success in this space. And so that helped a little bit with, you know, just people believing in us. And if we were excited about something that they were willing to back us. But, you know, that's, that's one of the challenges that presented itself in particular with this new game. Yeah. And then I think, I mean, the other ones are kind of the ones that exist for every game you're ever trying to launch. But this one in particular, it's a new sport, as you said. So it's not like people are going and searching for Paddle Smash. Uh, you know, the way you would search for, hey, what's a fun board game? And then you might like find a review site, you might find Dice Tower, you know, whatever it is, someone reviewing the game, you might find your podcast talking about a, a great game. Um, you know, no one's searching for Paddle Smash. So it's like, how do you let people even know what to look for? And that is a challenge. And I think one we're still trying to figure out. I mean, one thing we're doing is, you know, we're on this podcast, we're we're on a lot of podcasts over these next few weeks, um, trying to just spread the word. And, you know, the mission is, is like, what's the, what's the least costly way to let the world know about this product. And I mean, we're figuring that out, but one thing that I know is magical is you go out to a public park and you play this thing and people come up and ask about it and then they want to buy it. 
And so it's a lot of just that grassroots, getting it out into the hands of people and then letting the snowball start to roll. And, you know, there's a little bit of crossing your fingers, but I think there's a lot of things you can do to spread out your surface area of luck. And so one of the things we've just noticed is that if you just like start getting out there, things start to happen. An example is I was at like a, a public festival this last weekend. And here I am like out there slinging product, like I'm sweating my guts out. It's like 98 degrees. Um, and I'm just like grabbing people and bringing them in and making them play. Um, but like, it was really effective. And honestly, I walked away from that feeling really encouraged by the game, but we did, we hardly sold any. We, we didn't have any inventory to sell. So I was trying to get people to go online and buy. No one wants to pre-order a product at our price point three weeks in advance. So it's like, I wasn't too let down, but not a lot of sales from that. But even from that, we've like had a few follow-up emails from people that saw it. And then they were like, there's one guy that has a big company party. And he's like, I want that product there. I want you demonstrating it at the party. Like, and it's just those things that you just don't know who's going to see it. Um, that might, it's, it might just work. It's like, goes back to my marble story in the kiosk. Like we didn't know it felt like a failure, but this other mall saw us there and they were like, we want you on our mall. And we ended up getting in this amazing location. And so we've had probably almost a dozen things happen like that over just these few short weeks that we've had a live website where people have seen us from the very few social media posts, the very few, you know, it's like, the chicken and pickle story, or Tim, you tell that. Yeah, so you know, we hired. <laughs> curious, so we I'm really curious. Some... Chicken and pickle story. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so another thing that we're trying to do to get our, you know, just to get us out there, get people seeing the game, is post stuff on social media. And uh, fortunately, the inventors, I think Scott mentioned, has seven kids, and uh, two of his boys are high school age and love, you know, they're into social media and they're they're in love with the game. And uh, so we were like, hey, listen, why don't you guys start filming yourself and posting some of that content to social media? And so we've, you know, hi hired these kids to start posting some content. You know, by no means do any of us really know what we're doing, but we're out there. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, there's people looking and we've, we've been contacted. Uh, one, one person that contacted us uh, was the, you know, their buyer for a large uh, outdoor game retailer that we just had a call with yesterday. Nice. And so again, we're pre pre launch and we're already talking to the buyer at one of the largest outdoor retailers in the country. Um, so fingers crossed that, you know, that those, those conversations continue to go well. Uh, but another one was we ended up getting a sale. And it was, uh, again, we'd just gone live with the website. We had barely turned on anything in terms of the social media posts. And uh, we were just like, Scott was like, oh, cool. Like your buddy, you know, Neil um, uh, bought some. And I was like, I don't know, Neil. You know, some guy in Atlanta, Georgia uh, bought a couple of them. And so we, we Google searched who, who this gentleman was. And it turns out he's a pretty big uh, real estate developer um, from the Atlanta area. And is launching, you know, these concepts. Uh, they're basically like entertainment. So you could think of them, think of like a Top Golf uh, as like an equivalent. And you know, coming out with these pickleball and eating, you know, concepts where you go play pickleball and eat and have a good time, and kind of this active, you know, entertainment concept. And so, chicken pickle is, you know, one of those concepts, and he wants to carry them in his, uh, you know, in his restaurants and in, in his facilities. That's uh, it's exciting. Like you said you never know who's uh, how it's going to get out there, but it's a lot. Got to be a lot more fun than the the mall kiosk when you get to go out there and, and play a game and draw people in versus <laughs> try to cut them off in the hallway. <laughs> so much better. Yeah. So <laughs> in, importantly, um, when you guys when you guys play, uh, this is probably one of the more important questions. But uh, who wins? <laughs> <Would> you, <laughs> oh. Between you guys, who's 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 winning? Uh, yeah, so we haven't been together playing this in months. Um, Tim lives in Tennessee and I live in Utah. So almost all of it's over over Zoom or FaceTime. Um, so honestly, when we played early, it was like both of us just trying to figure the game out. I'd say at this point, I would, I would, I would be 
I played it a lot more than Tim. <laughs> yeah, I played a lot of pickleball. So I, I, Tim's very athletic. I'm sure he'd catch up to me quickly, but I think I'd have the advantage of having just played the game a bunch at this point. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll concede. I'm gonna have to give the nod to uh, to Scott here in the early days. Yeah. Early days. The fact yeah. that he's still yep. sweaty from playing just moments ago like <laughs> tells me he's I into don't know it. That good. It's an hour later. I should be. <laughs> <laughs> he's glistening. <laughs> Well, this is a uh, this has been just wonderful getting to one. Thank you for sharing your guys' uh, backstories, your origin stories. You know the the journey through the industry, and then just the excitement ar- around launching uh, a new sport. It's it's amazing. Um, you know, paddle smash like it's like the the perfect marriage of pickleball and uh, and uh, spike ball. Spike ball, yeah. So it's just wonderful. Um, but before we before we roll out of here. Uh, one thing we do like to do is throw a couple of uh, hidden roll questions at uh, at random for you guys, and we've got uh, the hidden roll die. Oh, okay, here we go. Okay. <laughs> and so Branson's <laughs> going to be your guys' surrogate roller, and uh, just going to throw out a couple of questions depending on what rolls here. Let's see. Let's do it. All right. The uh, the lightning bolt. Uh, what genre needs in the in the industry of play? What genre needs more toys or games? Oh yeah. What do we need more of as humans? <laughs> you're gonna get buzzed hmm. if you're too slow. Yeah, shoot. I mean, I think about this stuff all the time, and I'm just trying to think. Um, I'll go first. I'm going to say, you know, with, with family game night, I think there's a pretty big discrepancy of what adults find fun as well as the kids. And so I, I equate it to um, the Toy Story in the Pixar movies. You can go to watch a Pixar movie and watch Toy Story and enjoy it as much as an adult as you do as the kids do. And you'll, you'll notice like they throw in little like, adult innuendos and things that only the adults pick up. And I find that that's part of their genius is that, you know, adults enjoy those movies as much as kids. And I think that's something that in the, in the, in the kind of family game space, um, you know, that I have not come across where the adults truly enjoy playing the same game as much as the kids do. So that's my answer. That's a good All answer. Right. That's, doesn't paddle smash bring dads, you know, Brings dads and their their kids back together. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like this is bonding. I I was filming last night. My my brother in law and his kids playing. And there was like one scene where he was like standing over his kid who had fallen on the ground and like taunting him. <laughs> <laughs> like look at it, bringing parents and kids together. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'd say mine is. Huh, I, so I was looking at a top. Um, a top 100 list of the best sellers. Um, this is like NPD data for this year so far. And it's like almost all of the top 10 are these old, old classics. And so I just feel like what we need is some, some new modern classics, <laughs> we need new evergreens. Um, like, and I, I understand we're all trying to create evergreens. This is not like something that, oh, (laughs) people that are listening are like, oh, that's something I should try and create as an evergreen. Like we all want it. But I will say that a lot of the thinking, um, you know, I've worked at big companies now too. And I know that like a lot of the thinking is what's going to be a kind of flash in the pan, like success, but like not thinking kind of long-term, how do we make this thing so it will last? Um, From a quality perspective, yes, but from a gameplay perspective more, which is like, what will create enduring play that will pe- people will want to keep coming back to over and over again? Yeah. Um, you know, we do have a world where like so much of the kind of kids' skill in action is what people chase because it is big money. Um, but so much of that stuff is just one year. Like they just last a year. Um, and I just <laughs> really love the idea of us creating some new classics. I would love 10 years from now to have that top 10 list be a bunch of new stuff. I like that one. So, you know, sell the sell the new classics versus the novelty. Good answers, guys. All right, let's give another roll here. Uh, broken heart. Uh, oh, this is a fun one. What uh, game genre do you love to hate? 
I, I, I have one. <laughs> All right, so I'll start and then Tim, you can think. I love to hate the um, apples to apples uh, mechanic, which is the like <laughs> arbitrary judge. Um, <laughs> I mean, and we have seen wild success, obviously. I recognize that it's the mechanic that Gar- Cards Against Humanity uses and about a million other games, but I sat in the role at Marbles of Evaluating Concepts and then at Spin Master, I was head of inventor relations as well for games. And so, I mean, it just got so old to hear people say, okay, this game's like apples to apples. And I'd be like, please, no, never again. I don't it's ever oranges want to, to oranges. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'd say that like arbitrary judgment. And I mean, I'll be honest, I don't like it. I never liked it. I didn't like it in the apples to apples days. And even when it was a wild success, I like, I like games that have, uh, that's not that aren't arbitrary i like like clearly <laughs> defined reasons why you win or you lose and so that was my only personal, personal problem it's <laughs> good yeah so for, for me I'm, I'm the dad of a three-year-old daughter and i have a lot of you know young kids kids toys and i think uh the one and we, we talked we touched on this a little bit before the podcast started but you know there's just a lot of um cheap products that are that are being made these days and uh i would prefer that there were more kind of higher quality you know meant to be displayed and to be kept around for a longer period of time versus the use it a couple times and you know it's it's uh you know in the garbage and going to the to the trash so just some higher quality um manufacturing with some of the you know the concepts that are out there for the younger kids especially music to my ears tim (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i'm for that all right one final one. Ooh, star what is why don't you guys give me a couple of your top your top three go-to games right now that like you go to the game closet you're just going to go this is an, an easy no-brainer um a quick I'll go-to it, I'll, grab I'll, for I'll, you guys right now yeah, I'll I'll start. Uh, I'll give a shout out to our our buddy um, Brady Peterson. Uh, so Otrio is is one of my favorite games, and, and Brady also happens to be a close friend. Um, but he came out with a custom version of that that's really high end. Going back to what I was just talking about, it's like very high quality, um, solid wood and and uh, you know anodized aluminum pieces. And Otrio is not only a great game, but this is one of my go to now gifts if I'm going to someone's house for a housewarming or, you know, whatever it may be. So Otrio is, is definitely on my list. Yeah. I, the one that my kids just will play over and over again is cover your assets. Um, <laughs> and it's one that I have fun playing too. It's a funny thing because it's not like some earth shattering mechanic, but it's just good. It's like solid has all of these elements of like being one upmanship and, you know, like they <laughs> love the ability to kind of like, keep laying down cards and beating, beating the other person. And so that's just like one that if we say, what game do you want to play? My kids will almost always say, cover your assets. It's the one that gets brought up to me probably more than any other game for like, Hey, I just played this new game. It happened to me this morning. I was out, met a guy for the first time, found out what I did. And he said, I've just played a game for the first time that we love cover your assets. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> like, well, yes, as I, as it, happens i have heard of it um so that's one that i would say like it's just a really good go-to for for families fun fun well gentlemen this has been been wonderful again i just want to thank you guys for for taking the time to come on to hidden roll and share your story yeah it's been a it's been a pleasure and uh, thank you guys thanks for having us on this was absolutely. fun we appreciate it absolutely thank you so much well let's just go play some more games <laughs> we'll just give we'll give a real quick shout out uh, for those of you that are interested uh paddle smash.com is you know is where the game is going to be available um here shortly so absolutely so early, early september so i'm not sure when this will air but early september we'll have this game live and yeah would love love the support so thank you everyone and we'll in be sure to put any thousands of purchases. we'll have links in all the descriptions uh below but yeah for sure just check it out it's a uh, ton of backyard fun 
I've even been playing it indoors. <laughs> <laughs> that is a ton of fun. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. This has been Hidden Roll, the brains behind your favorite toys, games, and all things play. If you like what we're doing, the best way you can support us is to share us with your favorite brains. Please thumbs up, leave a review, and follow Hidden Roll Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok. You can also sign up for our newsletter at www.hiddenrollpodcast.com for a monthly sneak peek at our upcoming content. That's Hidden Roll, R-O-L-E, podcast.com. Our episodes are available on all major listening platforms, or if you'd like to see our beautiful faces, all of our content is available to watch on YouTube. If you know of someone who would be a great fit to appear on our podcast, or if you'd like to learn the story behind any toy or game, send us an inquiry at hiddenrollpodcast.com forward slash suggestions. Or let us know on our social media. We love to hear your feedback and ideas. Once again, special thanks to Pop, People of Play, the one-stop hub for all toy and game inventors. Visit www.peopleofplay.com to learn more. This podcast is also made possible by the continued support of the brains who never grew up, inventors of play, Streamline Design. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.